it's very difficult after listening to what Mark has said that I, I don't know, even know what to add. But since I was invited, I will say something. <laughs> so let me start by telling you a story at least. <clears throat> Democratic control and civilian control, they are two different things. But when in 2003, I was appointed as chief of army staff, and in Nigeria, the military headquarters is deep, different from the Ministry of Defense. So I went to the Ministry of Defense to see my minister, and there, was, there is the elevator, or lift, whichever English you speak, and and I was to be. Uh, I went with my little team, and when the elevator came, I was trying to walk myself because we were already in queue, and it was my turn. And um, one of the civilian workers in the ministry said, "No, the military have to subject themselves to civilian control." So it's our time to go, you have to wait. <laughs> so it depends on what you understand by civilian control. Some believe that everything, even the way the military should speak, they should take permission from the civilian. Then um, I also enjoyed certain questions that might ask, do we need a military in Africa? This I'll also share with you my experience. <coughs> Maybe if I don't, so that I can cover a little bit of my paper. If you want, you can ask me more during the discussion period. But let me start my presentation by quoting President Roosevelt, who over 60 years ago said, and I quote, we learned that we cannot live alone at peace. We have learned that our own well-being is dependent on the well-being of other nations far away. We have learned to be citizens of the world, members of human community, unquote. We are all members of human community, and the world has become a global village, and globalization has really taken a new dimension. And then the focus of power has so many centers today. So that means we must learn to operate together. I will touch a little bit about uh, <coughs> national security strategy, and then I will uh, uncle and conclude with talking about civil military relations. And during that, I'll cover some of the little questions that may bother some of you in your mind. Mm -hmm. For Bach had hit the nail on the head that the control is by the political leadership. However, we have to understand that each nation has to face the reality of globalization in planning the core objective for the national security. I will say three things to be the center core in whatever way you want to apply approach your national security. Um, that is, how do you enhance the security of your own nation? And to me, the security of our own nation in each African country, or most African countries, is human security. So that is real where the challenges are. And then, how do we work and have a prosperous develop economy to run the country. And then the last one is how do we promote stability, which include good governance and human rights. I think these are the core things that we uh, in our national security endeavor have to uh, consider. And this is why critical thinking and strategic leadership and planning becomes very necessary. Because they are, 
things that become necessary for our national survival. And that is why we will need leaders that have a thorough understanding of how to create prosperity and wealth so that we will be able to have resources to take ownership of whatsoever we want, especially when it comes to our own internal security. It is important that we take ownership by looking at the opportunities and the challenges that we have to face. And in doing that, I think we must look at our national interests. And that includes the vital interests of our nation. And what I call vital interests are those things that have to do with the survival and the safety of our country. And then we have to look at the important uh, national interests. And those that are those interests that have to do with our well-being as, as a nation and as a country. And then we will be able to operate in that global village that the world has become. And lastly, we have to look at the humanitarian side and all other things when we are talking about our national security. And in that process, then, we now ask, what type of tools do you need to do that? The military? And do you really need the military? I would say even for prestige, you need the military. But in the real sense, I remember in 2003, when I was appointed chief of army staff, I was called at the, uh, the Senate, and I was asked, that what should be the strength of the Nigerian army, and we, and what should be the structure. And I said, I don't know. <coughs> and everybody, the senators, were surprised that how can the chief of army staff say he doesn't know? And I said, I'm honest, I don't know. Because Nigerians have to decide what type of military do they want. What job do you want the military to do? And that is, those who have followed the issue of Boko Haram in Nigeria, we know it has become very glaringly that we want every job to be done by the military. It's not possible. So you define what type of military do you want and what role would your military play. Then you will begin to know the strength you want and the equipment you require, and then you will train them to perform that role. And that is what Mark has said very clear, that it is not the responsibility of the military to decide. It's the responsibility of the society to decide the type of military they want and the role they want that military to play. That takes me now. Uh, yeah, Mark has covered a lot of ground, so I will just quickly touch on the issue of how do we then foster a better civil-military relations. And it, it reminds me, when I, when I was in NDU, uh, ICAP in those days, uh, 20 years ago, I wrote a paper on civil-military relations in Nigeria. And so I, I, I adopted the paper recently, and I said, OK, let me share with you. So these are some of the things that drop out of that paper. One of the things to improve a better civil military relation is the knowledge of the military by the civilians. Because there is a big gap in most of our countries about what the military is doing. And why do you need them? Why do you need the other security sector uh, complement of government? Why do you need them? And how do you keep them? So we have to get uh, people in government, politicians and others, to understand what is the military all about. What is the other security sector element all about? And what role do they play? And what value do they add to the society? Then, 
there had to be a close collaboration. And in that, I have seen what I have seen uh, happening, even the invitation of you all here, you are from ministry, you are from gender, you are from uh, Ministry of Justice and other areas that actually help to bring stability and good governance. Then, in that collaboration, there should be, and, and, and I always advocate, a training area, a training institution, whereby there will be this interaction. Because as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, we fear each other because we don't know each other. We don't know each other because we don't communicate with each other. So the more you communicate, the more you know about yourself, the easier it will be there for that collaboration. If we don't, some ambitious politicians or ambitious military officers will use the weak civil military relations and weak control or non-existence of the control of to create instability for their own personal interest. And they, in doing that, they will destroy um, they will destroy democracy and they will now turn the, the military, the security sector element, the police, the custom, the immigration, they will turn them to become a regime change, a regime protection. Instead of protecting the nation, they will now turn to protect the regime. And that is part of the challenges that need to be done. We have to also strengthen the democ uh, democratic institutions. You see, most of us in Africa think that democracy, uh, democratically government, is just election. And then once the election is over, bye-bye to democracy until the next election. No. You need institutions, strong institutions, that will help in uh, that, for example, rule of law, civil liberty, even the succession, how the next government takes over from the current government is something that needs to be addressed and needs to be worked out. And then we have to allow government mechanism to operate. The military should be allowed to perform their role while subjecting themselves to the government uh, of the day and to the political leadership. It does not in any way mean that they should subject themselves to the president and his cabinet. Presidents come and go, but the nation remains, and your loyalty and allegiance is to be to the nation and not to the government of that day. And you should be able to know that you have to express your function and everything to the society. And then the legislative arm is very important. The legislative arm is the arm that represents the people. And they control the budget, hopefully. Because in some of our countries, the executive takes over everything. They even want to become the judiciary. And that is where the danger comes. When the executive wants to be uh, the government, they want to be legislative arm, they want to be judicial arm, then you have problems. <laughs> and then you need one any time that you have a reason to bring out this, uh, your military, they should come for a short time to perform the role, not to stay permanently. Because the more they stay permanently, the more they become a problem. And when you need them, the society does not respect them or fear them any longer. So it has to be. In your, the, 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 the military should be all inclusive. Everybody should feel part and part of that military. So when it comes to recruitment, there should be no discrimination based on tribe, based on religion, 
but it should be an inclu inclusive thing for everybody. Because once we do that, what we don't do that, we will now have selected people, and they will now feel that the military is their property, and they will use it the way they want to use it, which is very dangerous for the society. And that is also lead to this politician now using the military to survive in, uh, and to make sure that if you raise any observation, you will be crushed. It's important that the public and the, the civil society is allowed to mirror the military. Uh, and the, 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 the military and the security sector element should also listen. I'm sure when they have done something good, the public will applaud them. And when they have done something bad, the public will raise a huge and cry. And they should now be able to be um, they be able to manage it. This is maybe an interesting one. There's the cool <coughs> ceiling and middle officer round issue. There's a ceiling that you can avoid coups. Take note. And there is things you can state and create coups. And what is this? It's all defined more or less by the uh, capital gross national product, GNP. It has been discovered that countries that have a GNP of about $1,000 hardly have successful coups. They will be attempted coup, but they will not be successful. Like Turkey. Oh, well, Turkey is out of Africa, so they are not Turkey. Yeah. And any country that has a GNP over 3,000 will never have a coup. And check, you will find out they will never have a coup. But any country that has GNP below $500 is wrong. And that is why at one time my country was specialized and very prone. And so many other countries here. Because poverty creates a lot of challenges. And when the government is not doing anything to bring prosperity, rather wealth is shared by a clique, it brings instability. When you have to be a politician or you have to be a minister to become rich, when a person who was trekking on foot and becomes a minister, and after one year is riding on the latest car, then you know that there is something wrong. And these are the things that uh, create the dissatisfaction that needs to cool. So, what government needs to do is to be careful with the middle ground. Major Lieutenant Colonel. The fact it has been found in studies. Uh, but to really avoid coups, government must endeavor to have a very strong middle class. Once you have a strong middle class, then the <coughs> issue of coups will be gone or will be reduced considerably. Um, then there is also the need to administer the military by providing the legitimate uh, requirement. The military cannot perform its duty, or uh, the civilian cannot ex exercise their authority, unless the machinery of government allows military and civilian perspective to mix in formulation of any policy. Anything that affects the military itself, they should be asked. They should be brought onto the table to discuss. And finally, to insulate, to remove the officers and men from partisan politics. We should not allow recruitment, promotion, deployment of officers and men and women to be based on religion, ethnicity, 
or any other things. If we base everything on merit and we make sure that the best have access to any limit as long as they perform and uh, their best, then you will find out that the executive arm will have no fear of who's, the nation will have no fear, and then an executive and a legislative they must make extra effort to know and understand the military, what are their perspectives, what are their professional needs, what are their obligations, and what are their requirements. If these are done, and among so many other things that we can discuss, I believe that civilian control is a must and must be accepted as unquestionable by the military, by the politicians, and by the people. Thank you.